All right. Telephone, we're going to get started back up. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on the final leg of our journey. Once again, my name is Lindsey Brock. I'm the chair of the Florida Bar Admiralty Law Committee. Thank you all for being here. And our next speaker is none other than the man that helped bring all this together. We all wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, uh, for Robert picking up the phone and calling Michael McLeod, as he told about earlier. So, with a quick overview um, and a really, really, is this like shoots and ladders? I'm really interested in seeing this. Great chart he's got set up here on vessel arrest, Robert Gardin. This is where <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. <clears throat> Thank you, Lindsay. Can we turn out the lights a second? Yes. No one go to sleep. Um, because we have so many different levels of expertise in this room, including students, paralegals, law clerks, I asked uh, Brett Rogers, uh, to, who is with the, uh, you know, the Law Society, Maritime Law Society here, he's the Admiral of the uh, UM Maritime Law Society, to help me develop, uh, so to speak, a, uh, if you will, a nautical chart that will help primarily, and I'm sure Michelle and Matt and many, many others here know this chart in their sleep, but, um, it's really to make sure you don't leave any steps out in effectuating the arrest and basically uh, up until the point where the vessel is either released through bond or it could even be released prior to that because of the probable cause hearing not being met. Um, it's really not for the seasoned arrest lawyer or who has experienced many, many arrests, but it's good for those that are in your office that may so I gave everyone a copy, and of course we'll send it out to, uh, to everyone um, with the materials. Um, I don't think I need to go through it. It's very uh, self-explanatory, um, but we did have the assistance also of uh, Brett Rogers and Alex Cook, also with the University of Miami. Why don't you two guys stand up? I really thank you guys for all your help. <laughs> Uh, they, they, were, they were instrumental in getting us this room uh, and also the area for the reception and a lot of other things. The AV department, I want to thank them for uh, putting together uh, the necessary equipment to get this thing recorded and we'll be able to put it up in YouTube. Uh, essentially, now we can go to my other uh, presentation. I'm going to be skipping uh, through a fair number of points that I've raised here because they're going to be in the um, materials that you get in the handouts, but it would be uh, important to just probably highlight them. And that is, um, for example, um, in for many foreign countries are members of the International Convention relating to arrest of seagoing ships. And the United States is not. That is why in the US, we strictly go by vessel arrest under Rule C. This is the only place, and it's under the supplemental rules, which is essentially for those that are not familiar with them. I've had some questions during the break that are, you know, fairly elementary. So I, I just want to touch upon this, you know, the supplemental rules are Essentially, they came into being in 1966. I don't need to get into the details, but they are uh, found. I've got a handout which uh, actually highlights the specific rules that apply to effectuate vessel arrest. Also, uh, for Rule B, as Michelle talked about, in seizing uh, debtor's property where the debtor is, is not in the district, but we're going to talk more about Rule C. And before we do, we have to determine if what we're arresting is a vessel. And that is the critical Lozman test, as in every case we have to look at that. I don't want to 
belabor this because Lindsay uh, and Mike are going to talk about it briefly, but the um, you know poet Riley came up with the poem of or, or the the parable when I see uh, a bird that walks like a duck, s swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck. I call that bird a duck, and that's the practical. Uh, consideration is, that I think the Supreme Court echoed when they issued the Lozman decision. Um, the bottom line test of the Lozman decision, um, you know, is the practical, um, not a theoretical, a practical view of the function of the vessel and whether or not it is practically capable of transporting people or things over water. It's almost easier to look at it from the perspective of what is not a vessel. And there's been a number of cases that have come out since the Lozman decision. Obviously, uh, you get into um, uh, different aspects of the case, um, whether or not admiralty jurisdiction applies, whether it doesn't. Uh, but we're talking about vessel arrest here and reaching the point where you could actually have a supplemental Rule C arrest. Uh, you know, you, you hear about, well, the courts are not allowing uh, or not determining a structure to be a vessel. Well, when you think about that, it walks like a duck, swims like a duck uh, approach. And I put the pictures here to illustrate this. None of these really look like a boat. None of them really look like a duck, if you will. Um, so we have the Lamel St. Charles Gaming. We have the Greasy Mendez. We have all of these different cases that um, essentially, um, and I'll go through them pretty fast, Essentially, they do not uh, even closely resemble a vessel, a gas bar. Um, so <clears throat> there's been, uh, since the Jaldi cases, um, Michelle briefly mentioned, um, where electronic uh, fund transfers are no longer uh, available as they were before and created a lot of litigation in New York. Uh, there's been a case that came out where, in the Jensen versus Rollinger case, where I believe they uh, actually seized about $400,000 in IRAs that um, the uh, court was quick to point out that the traditional rule B attachments, even after Jaldi, are still a viable alternative uh, and allow a quasi and ram. Uh, maritime attachment. So, you know, if we, you know, Michelle was insinuating that you can get a lot of information from different people, different situations arise where you might be able to determine that the owner of the vessel, while his vessel is maybe in Venezuela somewhere, he may certainly have funds in the U.S. and cert or in the Southern District, and certainly those funds are attachable just as they were before under the typical Rule B attachment. And the fact that the Jaldi case does not allow electronic funds transfer is clearly not anything to do with the traditional approach to a Rule B attachment. Um, I'm going to skip over these because we're getting into um, a I want to move into Rule C. Um, basically, this was a um, case where the um, strike that. Okay, we have um, we're Giuseppe versus. Uh, the United States involved the Coast Guard trying to um, seize a vessel under the Pollution Act. And the court came in and entered an order uh, wherein the, uh, essentially 
the arrest was vacated because of the high values that were being placed on the um, on the on the uh, stipulation. <clears throat> Let me find the okay. I've got my stuff a little bit out of order here. The vessel was uh, charged with violating U.S. pollution laws, and they filed an emergency motion for release of the vessel, with the court charging the Coast Guard as demanding high take it or leave it bond in bad faith. The court granted a motion to dismiss for lack of uh, subject matter jurisdiction and ruled that final agency action under the Administrative Act was neither a Rule E nor an Administrative Procedures Act providing jurisdiction uh, basis for uh, review of the court's seizure of the vessel. Um, in addition, we had another case applying, this case was applying Rule C. It was a combination of errors, and this is very important. When you draft a complaint, you have to put all of the salient facts that would support a Rule C arrest. Uh, the court found that there was a combination of errors and ambiguities in the drafting of the plaintiff's general terms and conditions and was unwilling to hold up the arrest of the uh, assets um, and, just, and would not rewrite the contract for the benefit of the parties. Um, this was another case where a Rule C arrest uh, warrant was rendered moot because it was not a vessel. Uh, so again, looking at the first question, and this is the uh, Armstrong case, um, the court clearly um, held that it was not a vessel. This was a uh, floating clubhouse, which was the court actually said really looked very much like the Lozman case, or uh, structure. Um, again, Michelle talked about the prompt post-attachment and post-arrest hearing. Uh, it's important to understand what that hearing is. It's only for the court's determination of whether probable cause for an arrest was properly entered when the court entered the issuance of the arrest order on an ex parte basis. Um, the plaintiff holds that burden of proving that he has met it, and this could be in a maritime lien case, it could be in a marine, in, you know, in, in a Jones Act case, uh, any type of case, you've got to establish essentially that your elements are in fact there and um, that you do have probable cause to arrest the vessel. It's not, um, to determine the entire case. As uh, Michelle pointed out, the uh, issue is we must show by a preponderance of the evidence that it, you're entitled to a valid maritime lien in a lien case or in any other case, you've got to prove your elements of your claim. Um, so this is... Uh, a reiteration of, and it's all focused on a Rule E uh, 4F hearing where, in fact, they're seeking a uh, release of the vessel. If you don't meet your requirements, you've got to meet those elements. You've got to prove those elements, and the burden um, is, is on you as a plaintiff to do so. Um, this was an interesting case um, because... Um, it was, uh, as you can see, a number of barrels of crude oil, and it was 60 miles offshore, and there had not been arrest, an arrest effectuated. And these cases, by the way, all come out of 2014, uh, for the most part. I think there's a couple that are 2013. Um, but basically the court um, would not... Um, allow the arrest warrant to proceed. 
They vacated the warrant and determined through a review of admiralty jurisdiction and also whether or not the uh, territorial limits of the court, if you remember, Marshall Wilner had put, put up the actual territorial limits of the U.S. Marshal um, as the U.S. waters. This was somewhat 60 miles off of Texas. And uh, the court determined that it would vacate the warrant and not allow the rest to proceed. Um, okay. All right. <clears throat> In Rule uh, E5, um, this permits, and again, these are all the supplemental rules, permits the release of the vessel um, and allows a stipulation. There are cases that have come down in the last few months that are essentially district court cases which analyze the, the interplay between the supplemental rules uh, and the different elements in the supplemental rules that allow um, either the rest to be upheld or the vessel to be released. In St. Clair, um, this was a Eastern District of Michigan case, and you can see the interplay. Uh, the r Rule E5, which permits the release of the vessel upon a stipulation, the claimant had attempted to offer to stipulate, and the claimant indicated that he received a check in his um, trust account, or his attorney's trust account, for $11,200. It goes on to uh, analyze the court, basically said, well, the claim is for 16200 and by the time you add the attorney's fees and everything else, it's gonna be something like $20,000. Um, the court felt that the, uh, because the parties had not reached a stipulation, that it was required then to post a bond. Um, so if you go back to uh, the chart, you'll see there's three different ways in which the bond um, can come about. Um, there is a, an agreement, of course, stipulation. The court can set the bond. Um, and uh, if there is, uh, of course, there's, let, you know, there's a number of, uh, like, the letters of undertaking, um, different approaches that can be made. Um, in this particular case, the court allowed um, or ordered the bond to be placed on the, um, and did not allow the counterclaim to be, or say that the counterclaim needed a bond. Um, the, going to um, the um, supplemental rules in Rule E8, Rule E8 allows a restricted appearance. And this particular appearance, you'll remember that several years back in Rule 12b, the age-old distinction between special and general appearance was abolished, and you could enter a special appearance and then set up your defenses for personal uh, jurisdiction or lack of personal jurisdiction and sufficiency of process, et cetera. However, um, the court was quick to point out in the Middle District of Florida in this case, is, again, a 2014 case, that, um, no, I'm sorry. <clears throat> 2009, that the distinction has survived in maritime cases. Rule E8 allows for a restricted appearance, and it must be a restricted appearance, uh, where the defendant, in personam defendant, does not submit himself to in personam jurisdiction of the court. Um, Now, 
Moving along to rule E9A1, and this is the um, Secor Marine case. In a Secor Marine case, uh, this was an issue of the interlocutory uh, sale. And the court, finding that the claimant had not posted a bond, that there was an unreasonable delay, and uh, essentially one of the criteria had been met, which uh, the court felt um, essentially that the eight months did constitute unreasonable delay. And this is uh, a Middle District of Florida case. Um, so they granted, uh, granted the interlocutory sale. Um, in this case, uh, the first American title insurance case, um, the court felt that the expenses associated with this, keeping the vessel, were just too excessive and disproportionate and allowed the uh, sale to go through. Um, this is a case very similar to the examples that Michelle placed on the board where the vessel was valued at only 50 to 60,000 and the mortgage was 192,000. The plaintiff had expended a number of costs, of course, substitute custodial costs, et cetera. And um, the court did allow the sale uh, because at least one of the, um, and that's the expense of keeping it was disproportionate. Um, Now, once the, you do get the vessel sold, you're going to have to seek confirmation from the court, and it needs to be filed within seven days of the sale uh, under local admiralty rules for both the southern and middle districts. Um, there are some districts, actually, uh, I think very few, but a few local rules that we came across that actually uh, do, do permit an automatic, but none of, none of the Florida courts. Um, this is um, it does require it in Florida. All right. All right. This was a case where. The vessel had been there a number of months. It was subject to just basic saltwater environment. And the court said that that was that decay, that typical sitting there eight months, sitting there six months, et cetera, was not a sufficient basis, absent specific evidence of deterioration to the vessel. Uh, just the mere allegations that it was deteriorating uh, is insufficient. The court did enter an interlocutory sale based upon the, the uh, expense of maintaining the vessel in the custody of the um, substitute custodian in order to sell. Um, now, the 11th Circuit, uh, in a fairly recent case, um, this was in 2014. Uh, distinguished the review, the standard of review for both bench trial decisions, if you will, and bench trial court decisions of procedural matters. It requires clear error when the court makes a decision, uh, but abuse of discretion in procedural matters. And this was a um, a case that um, the courts said it was in the exclusive province of the judge, the appellate court, in non-jury trials to assess the credibility of witnesses, weigh, weight of the evidence, etc., and found that um, the permission for procedural matters was instead abuse of discretion. Now, um, in the okay. All right, this. Okay. 
Okay. Well, I just wanted to <laughs> get to the end. This is my first time, by the way. So <laughs> I've never done this before. Anyone have any questions? I have Could I answer your last one? Yeah. <laughs> before I go to this one? Yeah. No, I'm serious. Um, because there were some students here, and I got a question about it during the break. And the reason that you can't represent, or it would be unethical, to represent a master or a crew member, where you have a limited funds potentially coming from the vessel, is because the, um, uh, essentially the, the, that particular crewman has a preferred lien versus the lien of necessaries, which was not a preferred lien. So you really, it starts to become conflictive because let's say, for example, you have a, a guy who came in and said it's $10,000 that they owe him, and the yard that's saying it's $20,000 that they owe him, and the vessel's worth 30. How do you possibly rectify that? Uh, when you go to sale, you've got to pay the U.S. Marshal, you've got to pay the other party, the, the yard, you've got to pay the crewman. Uh, so you do have a serious conflict of interest in terms of of uh, essentially uh, the level of lien that you're dealing with. You can't tell the other client, um, you know, well, you just didn't get any money. You know, that doesn't work out that way. Um, and you can't give preference ethically over one or the other. Uh, someone asked the question, you could you do it in your retainer agreement. I'm not sure that's the proper place to do it, um, but it should be done as early as that, at least to let someone know that this is the reason you can't represent them. And if they want to come to an agreement on their own and go seek another counsel, that's, I think, up to them. But it's a problematic, very problematic situation. Go ahead. What's your question? Well, yeah. The question, the question boils down to whether or not the defendant gets to raise the bond issue uh, as to the amount of the bond in a post-release hearing. Is that correct? Post-arrest hearing. Post -arrest hearing. And then, and, Well, you know, the, the pleadings requirement is that you itemize or specify your claim. If this is a crew claim, you're going to need to have specified in your verified complaint the amount that you are seeking as a plaintiff. And certainly, um, if the court is ex assessing bond, and this is where it becomes almost uh, an issue of one judge deciding, uh, I'm going to allow more evidence than another. Because you do have, um, um, as long as you're, you're, you, as long as the court's already decided that the there was probable cause to arrest, and the court is assessing the bond, it's going to be allow a certain uh, uh, evidentiary proof or proffer from both the plaintiff and the defendant. Am I getting your question or? Yeah. The rule. Hmm. 
Right. right. Of course. So, what's appropriate? There's no rule on that. Well, there isn't a rule, but, but I think the courts... I mean, if you look back at some of the decisions, um, you know, I see the courts typically taking a, a number of factors into consideration. They're going to they're gonna want to know what you established, I believe, the, the pecuniary damages to be, the non-pecuniary damages. How did this counsel come up with this figure in his verified complaint? And that's an ethical, an ethical issue, I think, as plaintiff's counsel. You've got to come in and say, okay, I can't ask for half a million dollars if this guy has, you know, a soft tissue whiplash injury. Uh, it's just, you know, unless you're a very good attorney. <laughs> You're going to have to go through your... You're going to do that. Do I get to respond as defense counsel? Oh, I think you should, yes. And I think the courts, typically the judges will let you establish maybe uh, valuations from similar cases. That's the only evidence that I've uh, experienced. It's, um, personal injury. Yeah. On, uh, you know, on other cases where it's property type claims, or, uh, you know, it's fairly easy. You go walk in with surveys, valuation surveys, or, or whatnot, and you can show the court, and the court will assess the bond. But um, I think the most nebulous area is crew claims. Um, yes? Uh, I mean, isn't there a difference between a show cause hearing and a bond hearing? Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I think what we've been kind of mixing the two up. I mean, the there's the show cause hearing that did you have a yeah. prima facie case and there should be a separate bond hearing. Yes, you're absolutely correct. The amount of the bond. You're, you're absolutely correct. And the show cause hearing, uh, basically the court is there uh, to make a determination of whether you have met probable cause and can't really, there's even uh, actually one of my cases in the materials I'm going to send out where the court actually said that if um, you're, it's not the fact that you presented your case and passed the probable cause test doesn't mean that you could piggyback that into a motion for summary judgment. It's a whole different ballgame. Uh, they're not uh, s similar. And what you're asking is, are they separate? Absolutely. They are separate. You then would have a bond hearing if there was a determination there was probable cause to make the arrest. Absent a stipulation, absent uh, an agreement between counsel and a motion for release. One of the things that I've experienced in, uh, on a crew claim is that they asked me to take a letter of undertaking. I get the, the certificate of insurance and it turns out to be a syndicate that is, I do a little investigation, I find out that one of the carriers has essentially gone belly up and I understand that, or at least is on its way to belly up. And then I look at it and it says 50-50 or 70-30 or whatever. And that liability is several. It's not joint. So when you enter into your, um, you know, essentially release bond and or letter of undertaking as plaintiff's counsel, if you would essentially accept that letter of undertaking, which I particularly am very leery of, and I know they're used quite often, but I always ask for, if it's a domestic insurer or, you know, if it's, if it's a foreign insurer, I ask for a bond and a domestic insurer, you know, and a domestic bonding company, um, travelers or whatever. I, you know, there are um, problems that arise because here's the boat, it's gone, you've let it go. And now, you know, what's the court going to tell you? Well, too bad. You let that boat go. You agreed to the letter of undertaking, Mr. Cardena. And uh, now you find out that your insurer, the insurance you thought was there insuring that vessel was worthless. So where's your claim? And well, what do you do to the client? But don't you want to distinguish between, an, you know, an LOU from an IG club is a different kettle of fish from, you know, some syndicate somewhere, maybe. 
Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Would I mean, so. Don't, I don't we're not going to turn everybody against <laughs> the defense. I mean, the history of the IG, in fairness, they haven't yeah. defaulted on one yet. You know? So I think you've got to distinguish that. And any standard LOU is going to allow you to convert it to a bond if you get the... the well, right. yeah, it, it should. It, you know, we as practitioners come across many different things. You're right. Any other questions? Okay, thank All you. Right. Thank you. Okay, and now, uh, who, is it, you, Lindsay, yes. you're up? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so. Okay, so, uh, Lindsay Brock, Michael McLeod, and we're gonna do real brief update on Lozman. Uh, there's been a ton of cases that have come out there, and when I shepherdized it and I was going through them all, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, there, are, there are a few, though, that, I thought were kind of interesting. I thought we would hit on those. The <clears throat> come up, yeah. Uh, the first one is is a criminal case. It's not really a maritime case, but what was interesting is this the uh, the scam for U.S. And in this case, the issue was uh, part of whether or not the structure was an integral part of the crime. I don't know. Criminal law was my worst. Great. Robert, I got a D in criminal law. Um, so I was like, okay, I don't know. Where's the cool stuff? Where's the stuff about maritime? And this I would call it maybe a black swan. Uh, how many of you all were at the Sealy meeting when we did the practical effects of Lozman and we had all the different people, you know, that, that, that came out there and talked about some of the problems? I never thought that there would be a criminal law issue, but, but the court in doing this analysis said, well, you know, you've got to look at it and say a building, if you've got a floating structure, that may not qualify as a building if it is indeed a vessel and in this Massachusetts statute and looking at it. So it popped up, I just brought it up to say, these are the crazy things that nobody can really predict is gonna happen when they start playing around with the definition of a vessel is, well, you know, it's a different crime if you did this and this. It's a different aggravating circumstances, which what they had uh, in this case. So just thought I would mention it. Um, yeah. Next is, are we doing? There, oh. here's, a, here's a crazy one. And Alan, I, I remember calling Alan this case a couple of years ago. Um, and this is going on in California. And you would never think this would happen out of Lozen, but this is actually going on. Um, everybody knows what um, the medical marijuana statutes are, right? And in California and, and, and Florida, I'm not exactly sure how it works, but in California I do because I have a client that got, had an issue with one, with a crew member. In California, you get a medical marijuana card. So, you're, you know, if you get pulled over and they have everything from brownies to potato chips to goldfish to whatever that are made out of pot. Um, and there is a very distinct preemption issue. And the issue is, is whether the federal law against um, illegal drugs preempts the California uh, medical marijuana statute. And so when you get into Lozman, the issue is, like for example, if you're out on Catalina or, or somewhere like that and you're in your, you know, you're in your sports fish and your wife has a medical marijuana card and she's got marijuana goldfish, you know, that is illegal. And you can get boarded by the Coast Guard if they so choose, and they can take your boat, and they can do all kinds of bad things. But if you're next to her in Lozman's little shack, you know what? There's no preemption issue because it's not a vessel. So you have, there, there's this, in the mooring fields in Northern California, there's a big issue about this. And nobody would ever thought, I don't think, that, that you would have this Lozman issue about whether or not you can smoke pot on your boat with a marijuana water <laughs> That's it. I mean, that, what is that going to happen? Maybe there's so. a cottage industry out in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. I don't know, but you're going to see it here in Miami. I guess <laughs> they have this. Yeah. You can say, no, no, this quarter barge is out there. <laughs> not a boat, Smoke man. shack. <laughs> yeah, not a boat. Here's my car. Get off my boat, Coast Guard. You know, that, that, so there's some weird, weird stuff that's come, coming about lately. <clears throat> Next one. You know this one? Start with. The 2014, or you want to go to Catlin? I want you to start with. Yeah, January 25th, Fireman's Fund. Okay. This one. Okay. 
Okay. This one. This was uh, a, you know, another a dry dock case. And in it, I you know, quoted the, the sentence in there, applying the standard outline of Lozman, it's clear that the dry dock was not a vessel. But talk about what that led to. From that decision, you ended up with? In the same case? Yeah. The gist, the gist of this case is there's a marine insurance dispute. And they've invoked the jurisdiction of the federal court under admiralty and maritime law. And they get into a dispute of whether admiralty jurisdiction exists over a marine insurance contract. And this case is decided by the Southern District of New York. And they do this very peripheral analysis. And they say, of course, a marine insurance contract is maritime law. There's no question about that. The only thing that we have to deal with here is whether we have a vessel, because it's the race of the contract, right? It's the subject of the insurance. And they go through this Lozman analysis, and they decide that, and this is January 25th, 2013, they decide no. Because this structure that, although you have a marine insurance policy, the structure that it's actually insuring is not a vessel, so there's no admiralty jurisdiction case dismissed. January. 25th, 2013. What happens then is four months later, the same issue comes up in, in the District of Puerto Rico in this Catlin case that Lindsay's going to tell you. You want to tell them a little bit about it? Yeah. Um, this was, again, it was another dry dock case. And in this one, the court had said there's no, um, you know, dry dock's not a vessel. Again, the same kind of analysis of therefore it can't be a marine contract, the insurance, you can call it marine insurance, but if it doesn't insure a vessel, kind of like Robert, your, you know, the duck uh, quote in there, uh, you can call it whatever you want, but the court's going to look at it and say it doesn't apply to a vessel, therefore it's not. Went up on appeal, and interestingly, the, the judge doesn't really say, oh, okay, you know, doesn't really deal with that. It's like, that's not really what's important, we've got to go in and we've got to look at this contract. We've got to look at what it's actually insuring. That's the quote that we have there is where they say, you know, because the insurance policy issue between the parties <coughs> resembles marine insurance. So we go from our, does a, does a you know, a, a reasonable observer know if it's a vessel? I guess they've taken the, does, would a reasonable observer uh, look at it and say that it insures a maritime interest <coughs> against maritime risks it is a maritime contract warranting admiralty jurisdiction. And the court spent a great deal of time of talking about, you know, if you ever want to find a quote about what a dry dock does and everything related to it, the court goes into very detailed analysis of, well, historically, this is what they've done. These are the functions that they've performed. But they took it to a much deeper level than, than the, uh, the Southern District of New York. Yeah, what, what, what essentially happens, this court, and it's the same court, looks at this, this issue three times and changes its mind every time. <clears throat> and they follow this New York case that says this dry dock's not a vessel, and so therefore there's no maritime jurisdiction. They, they see that. And what happens is it goes to the magistrate in Puerto Rico. And um, in this case, this Catlin case, um, the the plaintiff alleged diversity and admiralty jurisdiction, and it's a, a coverage, a marine insurance contract covering a dry dock. So the magistrate sees it, knows about the New York case that's happened four months before, and does kind of the same analysis and says, no, you know what? Um, and actually, this is happening when the MAG has it, it's before Lozman. And she analyzes whether this is this floating dry dock, this is called the Perseverance, is, is a vessel under the pre lozman case law, and she decides that, yep, it's a vessel, so there's maritime jurisdiction. So during the 10-day period of magistrate review to the district court judge, Lozman comes out. And so of course they object, right? <laughs> right, you're laughing. I know you, so hey, look at this Lozman case, that thing's not a boat. And, and so they give it to the district court judge, the district court judge looks at it, they apply Lozman versus City of Riviera. They, they talk all about it, and the district court says, you know what, that thing's not a, not a vessel. I don't think there's jurisdiction. So just like the New York case, no maritime jurisdiction, this case is done. Plaintiff says, hey, wrong. I allege diversity. 
So you can't kick me all the way out. I got a breach of contract case here, and I have a diversity claim. And so they file a motion for rehearing, which most of the time you lose, right? They file a motion for rehearing, and something happens on a motion for rehearing with the district court judge, and it totally energizes this judge who really gets into this. And it's almost the first time. It really starts analyzing whether you can lose maritime jurisdiction over a marine insurance contract, which is historically maritime based on the fact that somebody comes and says, or a new decision that says that the race that the policy ensures is not a vessel. And so what happens is, is the judge gets into this analysis from the very beginning, and they go step, it walks, he walks through this step by step, and he answers the first question, is this a policy of marine insurance? And he goes through the an analysis, and there's a three-step uh, analysis where you decide whether this contract of insurance is a marine insurance policy. And he determines, yes, it is. Then he goes to the next step and he says, okay, well, if this is a marine insurance policy, that doesn't get you jurisdiction. What gets you jurisdiction is that it's a maritime contract. So is this marine insurance policy a maritime contract? And he starts peeling the engine and walking through that, going through the analysis, is there a maritime interest um, in, set forth in the contract as a whole, not looking at the race of what it's actually insuring. So is there a maritime interest? Yes. Does a policy insure against a maritime risk as a whole, not necessarily just this vessel, like reading the policy as a whole? And he, the answer was yes. So ultimately, the court in Puerto Rico says you can't just stop. It's not as easy as saying, oh, the insured risk, the insured race is not a vessel. You can't just say, okay, no maritime jurisdiction. You have to look a lot closer to determine whether the contract that you're looking at falls within maritime jurisdiction, and that whether the subject of that contract set forth in the terms overall, reading the policy as a whole, is maritime. And then look to see, look at the race. And when you look at the race now, you're not necessarily looking simply to see whether that is a vessel or not a vessel, but whether that race, whether that equipment impacts maritime commerce. And this, you had a dry dock, and the answer was yes. And so the Puerto Rican judge said, guess what? No vessel, but maritime jurisdiction exists. So it's a completely a, a, a thorough analysis. And the funny thing is, is then he blows off the question that he was asked to, to look at, which was whether there was diversity. He said, I don't even have to get there. And he did this all on his own. And, and Lindsay found one more case that follows this. And, 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 and I think what it did is, and Lindsay, tell me if I'm wrong. I think this policy was different than the Puerto Rican policy because this policy insured a number of different vessels. But, but say it insured like seven different boats, and one of them was found not to be a vessel. So this policy covered it. The one in Puerto Rico, though, was singular to this one, uh, ent this one piece of equipment that was determined not to be a vessel. Yeah, but so in the, the quote, and in this 2014 one out of the Southern District of New York, is you can see they're leaning a little more towards that way because you know, it says, although the uh, vessel status of the dry dock is relevant, it does not end the analysis. And then they go into, and it's a Kirby uh, case from the Supreme Court where they, they break it down. And, you know, and kudos for the courts that they're not taking that, because that was one of the things that when we were, when, when Lozman first came out and we, and we had the guy from Marine Insurance there, they said, what do you do with a policy that, insures it and now it's not a vessel. Is it still marine insurance? And everybody got bug eyes, well, I don't know. You know, and, and nobody was really sure how it was gonna play out. So it's interesting to see that, that some of the courts are doing that additional uh, analysis. Now, I believe all of these policies were policies that were written pre lozman so it's, it's going to be interesting to see if there's a change in the underwriting, especially as it relates to if you're you know, writing any policies on dry docks, uh, how that will play. Anybody got any experience on any post Lozman marine insurance on a dry dock? There's some endorsements. Some of the, uh, the domestic carriers are writing certain endorsements under the MEL policy and on the, uh, it depends on the, you know, 
in a dry dock, it's normally uh, ship repair. So you have your ship repair's liability, and then you have your MEL policy. So uh, I know of two carriers that have been talking about endorsements, but I don't know where that's ended up yet, because I haven't actually seen, I haven't had a case where I've had to actually evaluate that yet. So the endorsement you're saying is is that if it's not a vessel, we're still going to insure it's you for the risk? That, no, it's, it's not quite that clear. They just, what they'll do is, because the way it used to work before is that they have a schedule of vessels and they would include <laughs> dry dock, right? So now they're just taking the dry dock out, but making it clear that, uh, you know, especially when it's the MEL and the ship repair. Equipment with a maritime interest. Yeah. <laughs> In other words, what they're doing is they're still doing the usual exclusions for the, you know, the workers' comp and the longshore and stuff like that. And I know two carriers were talking about doing some kind of endorsement, but it's not going to be as clear as it's a vessel, it's not a vessel. What they'll do is they'll take the dry dock off the schedule of vessels, right? And then there'll be some language either in the policy or in the form of an endorsement that covers it. But that's, yeah. to, that's to clarify whether there's coverage under the policy, Correct. right? So now we're looking at it a little bit different. We're saying, is there an admiralty jurisdiction? And Alan, what do you think? Do you, you think the proper test, when you're looking at whether the federal court has maritime jurisdiction over this case, okay, is the proper test now considering the impact of, 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 of that piece of equipment or that insured, you know, whatever it is, vehicle on maritime commerce? Is that where they're going? Yeah, I think that's the way that they will have to go, given the, the precedent that's out there. And the, well, the dry docks, there's a lot of cases out there about dry docks in the past uh, and how they should be considered and uh, whether they're a vessel for injury cases and, and mm -hmm. you know, longshore and worker claims. So I think they'll fall back on that with respect to the dry docks. And they're saying, though, I don't care if it's a vessel. It doesn't matter. Okay, what they're saying is, you know, it could be whatever. It's, it's, it's how that thing <coughs> impacts maritime commerce. It's almost like the yeah. situs and nexus test for a tort. And what's the contract jurisdictional analysis? Quick, you know, Matt. Maritime contract. It's a Kirby. maritime contract. If impacts on navigation. The subject matter is. It makes it more. It makes it more similar to the situs and nexus test, so a nexus to maritime activity. I mean, how far was that going to go, really? I mean, that's. Okay. Those of you may not have heard the question from yeah, they the phone. Both, you both crossed over. So yeah. let's do this. Let's do the guy on the phone and then back in the back. So on the phone first. It was. Does it impact the question, if? The one of the definitions of a necessary is the utilization of a dry dock. For purposes of a dry dock, it would impact jurisdiction because it would it would tend to show that it impacted maritime commerce. Go ahead no, in the back. Well, I like this. The insurance company is not going to write policies that define admiralty jurisdiction. Okay. And that violates the cardinal rule. Admiralty jurisdiction can't, can't be invoked by agreement. By how do you how do you say that how you how do you say <laughs> that the 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 carrier can can write a juris write into a maritime jurisdiction? I'm missing that. I agree with you. You can invoke maritime jurisdiction by agreement. Absolutely, I agree with that. 100. How percent So how is the carrier doing it? By the type and nature of the risk. The, the right? nature of the risk being written under yeah being underwritten. Mm -hmm. Which is Who's? more in line with that analysis. Yeah, you know we're talking about the the Catlin case, where the court in Puerto Rico said, well, this is a marine insurance contract, and that was part of their analysis that they finally decided that there was maritime jurisdiction. But if you go into the the marine cargo field, um, in a, say you have a freight forwarder and they have a marine open cargo policy, and they are sh sending stuff on ships and they're issuing certificates, that's definitely marine cargo. It's a marine risk. But the insurance companies use the same marine open cargo policies to um, insure air freight, international air freight. And that's not a marine risk. 
and it's written on a, it's, the risk is covered under a marine insurance policy, but it's not a marine risk. So I think you have to be very careful yeah. about, no, about, really you, about saying just because it says marine insurance policy doesn't mean it's they actually in this risk. Port, this Catlin case in Puerto Rico they actually say exactly what you just said the, the title of the policy and the type of the policy you can't just nominate yourself a marine insurance policy and invoke admiralty jurisdiction and insure a motorcycle for example you right and do the folks on the phone get the uh, get the question where we're talking about why can you can't invoke admiralty jurisdiction by agreement of the parties uh, and in fact, in that one case, they tried, they tried to make that argument because they said, look, everybody calls it marine insurance. Both parties have called it marine insurance. And the court said, that we're going to go through, and they do that Kirby analysis. Oh, yes. Back in the back. <clears throat> Mr. Costabelle. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, the same question came up with the drilling rigs, if you remember. Uh, drilling rigs, the movable ones, not, not the ones that are fixed to the bottom of the oceans, but the ones that can make a certain movement. Uh, there were doubts about whether these structures were ships or not, and in fact, the thing came up in, in the Deepwater Horizon litigation. Uh, what happened is, for example, the, uh, something that I discovered digging into that, uh, the rigs uh, in Deepwater Horizon were a flag in the Marshall Islands. Marshall Islands have a very interesting legislation model on ours almost entirely. But as far as classification of the craft is concerned, they have a specific rule on movable drilling rigs. And if the rigs can make a certain amount of miles of movement on their own force, they are considered ships, otherwise they are not. Now, a, a drilling rig, if you look at it, is like the Lozman House, you know, it doesn't have the curtains, you know, that Justin Ginsburg wanted to have it as, as, a, as a house instead of a boat, but it's still not a ship. However, since it makes a certain movement, it's being considered a ship. A floating dry dock, in my opinion, is the same thing. Some, some floating dry docks, you can move them from one island to the other. So, so let me stop. I understand that. And they're saying, I don't care whether this is a vessel. So Jonathan, can I ask you right. a question? Skip. I really don't because we are talking about contract <coughs> maritime jurisdiction, not tort. Can you, can you tell, I mean, there's lots of people in here that don't do marine insurance, okay? And so can you tell us, wh what's the big deal? Why do you want this in federal court if you're a, a marine insurer and you want to file your deck action there or, 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 or what have you? Why do you want it sure. in federal court? Why do you want it under admiralty jurisdiction when you know... Um, Wilburn Boat exists, right? Isn't it Wilburn Boat that says well, that you're probably going to get stuck doing with state law anyway? So why, why, what's the big deal? Yeah, well, the Wilburn Boat doesn't require the application of state law, but by getting out of jurisdiction, you're going to get a federal judge with experienced, educated law clerks Okay. Doing whether or not there's coverage. So, you get, you get, you so get that's the benefit it. of a federal it's, it's judge. It's the judge that you want. You want a non jury trial. Non jury trial. Sure. <laughs> With the benefit of a federal judge. My name's Henry Walsh. Thanks. I was trying to whisper to you. I thought I was going to do that. Okay. You can also invoke a poor May fee day. Utmost good faith. Utmost good faith. Well, they actually went yeah, but you can, that. Do, that. You can do that whether you're in state court or federal court. You're just trying to explain it to his judge. He wants you in front of his judge. Right? It sure. I think it just boils down to the nature of the maritime claim because the bottom line is, is like the APT Titan case um, where the uh, court said, well, that... Gaspar is not a vessel. It was a suit for tools and necessaries. And the gentleman on the phone just asked the question about, well, under the Maritime Lien Act, uh, providing services to a dry dock, I think that the Lozman case is going to trump that statute, I think. Well, that's a good point. You mean, if, you're, if he's making the analogy that, hey, look, if you're going to get into an admiralty jurisdiction dispute and you're trying to further maritime jurisdiction, and the test is going to be whether that race 
uh, impacts maritime commerce, you could then look at that definition of a necessary to broaden the jurisdiction of the court and broaden the argument. That's totally true. That's a good point that he's made yeah, on the phone. It is. Yeah. Now, after going through all of that, and the last away. one that I found that I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, well, I emailed it to you, but I don't think either one of us had a copy of it here. But that can't stop us from talking about it. <laughs> is, uh, yeah, Martin, Martin V. Fabcon. This one, it was a quarter barge. All of these, I just kind of came up with these. These aren't the actual vessels involved in the litigation. That's an old Navy uh, uh, crew barge. Um, but it was, you know, barge like that. And the court didn't go into that full analysis. They went through and they did the analysis of the quarter barge. And they said, quarter barge, not a vessel. <laughs> Dismissed. I guess he had a busy docket. Uh, <laughs> but it was, you know, I mean, that was it. That was the ruling. Because the court finds the barge is not a vessel under Lozman, the court grants defendants motion and dismisses them from this case. Period. End of story. Um, so there's still some sifting uh, that's going to be going on as to whether or not the courts are going to go through and say, you know, because here's, here's I guess, <clears throat> for the ones that went into that, what I'll call the Kirby analysis, um, it didn't seem to matter to them whether or not it was a vessel or not. That was, that was immaterial. They were looking at, does this contract involve a maritime risk, something of an inherent maritime nature? That was what I said where they went through with what all a dry dock does. And everything that it does is related to maritime interests, maritime risks, and furtherance of maritime activities. You have that group of courts, but then you have these others that seemingly, it's, you know, your policy is for this. This isn't a vessel, therefore, your policy cannot be. You're just doing mental gymnastics to find a way for it to be maritime because this isn't a vessel. Um, yeah? The, the courts that are following what you call the Kirby approach, uh, taking a broader view of, of the policy as a whole, it's not that it's irrelevant whether or not it's a vessel, it's just that it's not dispositive if it's not a vessel. I mean, if you have something that's indisputably a vessel, that certainly weighs in favor of finding that it's a marine insurance contract. So vessel status, it's not that it's irrelevant, it's just that you can have a contract that's a marine insurance contract even if it's not a vessel. That's Mike, the point, yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. They're just saying that there's some courts that stop when, you, when they go through the analysis and say there's not a vessel. Some courts say, that's it, stop there. And then you're exactly right though, what you're saying. I'm so glad you're here though, too. Thank yes. you. And that's the, that's the he's uh, one of the students that that um, presented at our committee meeting for those that you attended on the phone. He did an excellent job with a number of others that won or Christine. What was your position at the uh, Christine's the Brown well. Moot Court? Oh, the Brown Moot Court. We we lost in the semifinals, but I got best advocate, so that was yeah. That you was were standing. terrific. And then we I, have another. Great. Yeah, Christine's here. Hey, how are you? <laughs> All right, good job. Thank she you for coming. Her, she did the paper. Um, but yeah, but no, you're excited. I mean, this, that was what the, uh, the Fireman's Fund out of the, from 2014, there we go. Well, it's relevant, but it's not dispositive that they want to go, they want to go further. But I, I question that in the sense of if it's relevant, <laughs> but you found out it's not a vessel, but your decision would be the same if it were a vessel, is the fact that it's not a vessel causes them to then have to do the Kirby analysis. And if that's the case, then that means the policy is dependent upon whether that is a vessel or not. Because otherwise, you would still be needing to make that same Kirby analysis. So it changes from whether, it's, whether or not it's a vessel. And this is the point he's making. Yeah. It's, it changes from whether or not it's a vessel to whether or not the race has an impact on maritime commerce. Yeah. Right? It, it, yeah, it seems saying. like what the courts are doing, yeah. and I haven't read these decisions, is they're sidestepping. We haven't the, either. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> they're sort of getting around the Lozman question by saying, even a, we're not sure this is a vessel. Lozman isn't entirely clear. It's a, it's a difficult question. Even assuming it's not a vessel, 
there's enough of a connection to maritime commerce to say that this is a marine insurance contract. Yeah. So we really don't even have to reach the question of whether or not it's a vessel, because even on the assumption it's not, this, this is not an admiralty question. All right. Well, that's it. There's your, there's your update uh, through that. We have one more. There you go. And now we'll move this back over here. Did you have a PowerPoint? Yes? Yes, he's got it. Okay. All right. And our uh, final speaker, Alan Richard, Florida State. And he's going to give us an update on the. Uh, here, let's turn around that way so they can hear better. Yeah, that's right. Update on the draft eligibility of Winston James. Uh, no. Uh, no, he can't be used as a means of transportation, <laughs> land or water. He doesn't have maritime commerce because he's still scrapping That's right. Okay. Um, we've got, we've run long and I've got little time, so I'm going to blow through this very quickly, but I will ask Lindsay uh, if you would make my PowerPoint available uh, on our website or on the TIPS website. Where's Robert? Okay. Well, we'll be emailing. I'll be make sure I email around everyone as well. Okay. So I'm going to blow through this relatively quickly. We'll start with uh, Florida legislation, most of which is taking effect as we speak, just coming into play uh, this year. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail. There were four bills that passed. The most significant is uh, dealing with commercial parasailing activity. Um, we had uh, two people die in Pompano Beach and then followed by legislation introduced. They've been trying to get this passed since 2008. 2013, legislature ignored it again and then about six weeks later uh, if our AV person would flip on the, that one, we're not going to play the whole video, but we will play the beginning of it. I had it embedded in the PowerPoint, and for some reason, it wouldn't play. Par parasailing accident in Florida. You've seen the video at the top of the show, too. Okay, where'd it go? There we go. Indiana teens critically injured when the cord that was securing them to their boat snapped, slamming into a building and many cars. ABC News has now learned that there are serious questions about the safeguards in place to prevent such accidents. And ABC's Rob Nelson has the latest on this story. Good morning to you, Rob. Uh, good morning, Josh. Of course, it's a holiday week and parasailing is a common vacation activity. But a blast of bad weather and a possible equipment problem caused a fun day in the sun to turn into a nightmare. It's the terrifying moment caught on camera. Watch as a parasail containing two riders breaks loose from the boat leading it and slams into two nearby condominiums in Panama Beach, Florida. All before crashing into a parking lot full of cars. Okay, that's good. Okay, coming only six weeks after Sine die. Um, it kind of got the legislature's attention, and uh, they passed this uh, white, uh, where'd we go, white uh, miscal bill. It adds four definitions, commercial parasailing, kiteboarding or kite surfing, moored ballooning, and sustained wind speed. There we go. Renumbers a bunch of sections. Commercial parasailing is just what you think it is. Towing people hanging from parachutes uh, behind a boat for consideration. Um, they've got to go up in the air and stay there while the vessel's underway. But it specifically excludes ultralight gliders. Kiteboarding, you get out there with a surfboard. Uh, I've seen people try it, not terribly successfully with water skis. But you have a kite pull you around. 
Um, it's the same meaning as in 14 CFR Part 101, except that 14, um, I got the typo there, that's not 33. 14 CFR Part 101 doesn't define kite. Um, it simply says it's applicable to any kite that weighs more than five pounds and is intended to be flown at the end of a rope or cable. Okay, moored ballooning, um, they just use plain English. It doesn't define that either. Okay, sustained wind speed, averaging the observed wind speed, rounded up to the nearest mile per hour over a two minute period. Boy, I'd like to see anybody try to enforce that. Okay. Um, throws in, changes the title. You can't use, does this have a laser? Adds more ballooning. You can't do it within 100 feet of the mark channel of the Florida Intercoastal, two miles of the boundary of an airport, unless otherwise permitted under federal law. Um, you can't engage in kiteboarding within one mile off the end of an airport runway. Uh, one mile off and um, quarter mile either side of that line, total of a half mile wide, unless otherwise permitted under federal law, which doesn't let you do it within five miles of an airport boundary anyway. Okay, there's your uh, federal requirements uh, within five miles of the boundary of any airport. Uh, if you're going over 150 feet, you get to give 24 hours to the nearest FAA air traffic control facility, and you got to attach colored pennants at 50-foot intervals by day and lights at night. Um, if the FAA would enforce their regs, that would pretty much kill kiteboarding for anything over 150 feet anyway. But um, there it is. Commercial parasailing, this is the important point. That's already in the law. You've got, for any parasailing, you've got to have an observer. That wide angle mirror you can use for skiing doesn't count. Uh, at night, life jacket, and don't tow your skier or parasailer into any fixed object. That's already there. Yeah. But now we've got, okay, lest the owner or operator first maintains, obtains and maintains in a liability insurance one million per person, two million in the aggregate per accident. Okay, has to be available for inspection and anybody who asks, you've got to give him the carrier's name, address, and the insurance policy number. This is the Plaintiff's Attorney Dream Act. Okay, got to have a current Coast Guard license of appropriate number of passengers, if you're carrying more than six, you can't use the OUPV, Operator of Uninspected Passenger Vessel License, um, and the displacement of the vessel has to be carried on the vessel and available for inspection. Well, that's just Coast Guard regs anyway. Notice it's, if it's required by the Coast Guard, you're doing this on a landlocked lake, all bets are off, you don't need a Coast Guard license at all, okay? You gotta have a VHF radio and it's got to be separate from a weather radio. You can't just have your one VHF and switch back and forth to the weather channel. Okay. Prohibited, more than 20 miles an hour wind. Wind gusts are 15 above the sustained wind speed. Uh, wind gusts higher than 25. Uh, rain or fog reduces visibility to less than half a mile. And this one's going to be real interesting. A known lightning storm comes within seven miles of the parasailing area. Known to whom? <laughs> known to the Weather Bureau? Known to the operator of the parasailing vessel? Uh, oh, I know that one, that's Fred. Uh, we're not sure what that means. We'll, we'll let the trial bar figure it out for us, okay? All available means to determine the prevailing and forecasted weather conditions. Wow. This is almost as good as the lookout rule. Talk about open to creative advocacy. What means were available? Okay. It's a second degree misdemeanor. If you screw up, on the other hand, it'll trigger the rule of the Pennsylvania. Okay. Technical changes, and this kicked in October 1st. This one um, addresses underage drinking. Okay, 
regresses a number of violations, what it does very quickly is uh, breaks it down to where you don't have to go to school, you can take an online school because we just couldn't get them in every county in the state. Uh, section two talks about our anchoring program. If you've been following that, it was about to expire. It would have expired July 1st, just passed. Um, Fish and Wildlife got it extended for another three years. Now it expires in 2017. There are only five places where anchoring ordinances are allowed. They have all been vetted publicly, approved by the commission. They are in place in these five locations, St. Augustine, uh, Martin County in the city of Stewart, St. Pete, Sarasota, and there's a series of them, Boot Key, Garrison Key, uh, down in Monroe County, okay? You still have lots of cities out there with have, with that have anchoring ordinances, notwithstanding the fact that it is a second degree misdemeanor for a city to enact, continue in effect, or enforce any of a laundry list of prohibited ordinances, including anchoring. Uh, there have been a couple cases that have gone to court. Barb had one down there in Stewart before they were part of this program, um, where the, the Vinnie Sibilla case, okay, uh, got the tickets dismissed, got a cash settlement out of the city, and it all came within, what, about a week after the U.S. Marshal served the Lord High Mayor and the members of the council. Uh, really got their attention when a U.S. Marshal walked in as opposed to a retired sheriff's deputy process server. Okay, um, same bill, once again, uh, it, you don't have to physically attend the driver improvement boating equivalent course. Okay. Um, vessel registration fees, there is a very limited list of what local governments can use the vessel registration fees for, and they have to account for it to the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission every year. If they don't turn in an audit, they don't get their money next year. It stays in the state treasury. And if they don't turn in for the audit for one year, it reverts back to the state. They don't get it at all. Uh, right now, we've got everybody's attention. All of the counties are turning in their audits. But it adds some things to it. Now, instead of just channel marking, you can have boat piers, docks, mooring buoys. You could have ramps. You could have um, boat hoists. You could have channel markers but this adds to it. You can actually maintain them, not just install them, and you can remove derelicts uh, that impede boat access using this money. Okay, uh, make some technical changes uh, and does a lot of stuff unrelated to boats and boating, uh, getting rid of obsolete hunting and fishing license fees. We are really running out of time. I will throw this one up there. Um, Divers down buoys are now legal. Has to be 12 inches by 12 inches, three or four sided. Um, I don't think you can see that any better than a flag, but that's the theory. Flags are only two sided. Uh, these things are three or four. The one point I do want to make is that free flying alpha flag has no legal significance in terms of a boating accident running over a diver. Uh, that's the equivalent of a seagoing bumper sticker. You need to have a one meter square rigid replica of that alpha flag. That means I'm a vessel restricted in my ability to maneuver. Okay, um, without going through all of these, what we've got is changes to the authority of local government and state officers to remove boats. Right now, if the boat interferes with navigation, they can get it out of the way by removing it from the water or causing its removal. Um, if it's a derelict vessel, they can get rid of it, but they don't have the authority to move it. Oh, it's drifted into the channel, it's blocking traffic, what do we do? Well, it's a darn sight cheaper to call CETO, have them drag it out of the channel and re-anchor it at the owner's expense than it is to try and pull the sucker out of the water and store it for him till he can claim it, okay? It's much more likely to get 
moved out of the way uh, at the owner's expense. But what they've done is provide a hold harmless in statute for the law enforcement officers and agencies that move boats or remove them or the uh, cause the removal. There has to be actual malice, willful misconduct, or gross negligence before you can go after the officer or the agency for having wrongfully moved or removed your boat. Oops. Uh, Coast Guard changes to the inland navigation rules and Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is doing some really neat stuff for boating restricted areas. The Coast Guard and inland navigation rules changes took effect. They conformed mostly to call regs, but they moved a bunch of stuff around that used to be in the pilot regulations, moved it into the actual rules, like lights on dredge pipes, lights on barges, things of that nature are no longer in the pilot rules. They're in the actual inland rules, which are no longer statute. They're now code of federal regulations. Okay. Um, What's most important, anybody here practice outside of Florida? Okay, if you're in a state that has its own set of inland navigation rules, they are preempted. It makes it very clear this is field preemption, not just conflict preemption. Um, there is some question from the way they phrased it whether it even preempts on landlocked lakes that are not navigable waters of the United States. Because it talks about in the definition of inland waters, says navigable waters of the United States and other waters, shoreward of the demarcation line. So what are other waters if not landlocked lakes? I'm not sure what it means. Um, they may simply have been parroting the call regs when it talks about separating roads, harbors, and other waters. Um, who knows what the courts are going to do with that? That one will be interesting to watch. Uh, what we're doing with the rules, for those of you who have been out on the bay and seen idle speed areas, like Rickenbacker Causeway, all of the various bridges going up and down Biscayne Bay, um, we're starting with the St. John's River, but moving throughout the state, relaxing that from idle speed to slow speed. Idle speed is bare steerage way. Slow speed, you can move as long as you're not coming up onto plane. You gotta be fully settled into the water with a reasonable wake, but uh, that can be three to five times faster than idle speed. And we're doing that in a process statewide. Okay, one last thing. Um, John McCain, our senator from that great seafaring state of, oh yeah, Arizona, um, has introduced a bill. It's talked about to repeal the Jones Act. It really isn't repealing the Jones Act. Um, it's an amendment to an amendment to the Keyst XL Keystone Pipeline bill. Um, which pretty much guarantees it's going to get passed and going to get vetoed, and then we'll see what happens. But in any event, what it does is remove the requirement that the vessel be built in the United States. That's pretty much all it does. It does not affect uh, negligent injury of seamen or any of the other stuff that's in the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, commonly called the Jones Act. And with that, I'm out of time. There's my contact information, and I'm told the uh, presentation will be made available to anyone. Yes. Thank you. And, and everyone here, including everyone on the phone, please be sure you go online to the Florida Bar. Uh, if you don't have it, you should have it. The uh, bar course number. Does everyone have that number? No. Okay. I have that number. And yeah, but not not everybody's got that. So the Florida Bar course number is one five zero zero three zero one N, as in November. Did everyone on the phone get that? 
Okay, one more time, and we'll send it out. Okay, if you email me, I will send this out with all the materials from the conference. But it is one five zero zero three zero one n like november so you will go online you will put that in tell any of your colleagues your associates or whatever they can go to the youtube channel under aba tips uh, they can view this that course code will be active until july 21st of this year the florida bar uh, advised me on that now we have fun time Okay, we're going to go out this way and go out to the balcony and we'll have a little reception that was sponsored by National Maritime Services and Fowler, White and Burnett. And uh, we want to thank all the speakers and all of you uh, in attendance and we'll be outside.